<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Today, Jolene and I are going to talk about cases where paranormal and true crime kind of meet. I'm going to talk about the Greenbrier ghost. Jolene, what are you doing? Oh, the the paranormal couple, Mark and Debbie, Cons I don't know how you pronounce her last name, though. Constantino? Both of these cases kind of interweave both of our interest in true crime and the paranormal. The Greenbrier ghost is a woman named Elba Zona Heister Shue. She was from Leesburg, West Virginia. And she was only married to her husband for just a few months. And this was like back in 1897. One morning, the little neighbor boy that helped her do chores around the house came over and found her dead at the bottom of her stairs. Well, the little boy ran and got her husband. He came and, you know, distraught husband holding her, holding her head and crying, you know, all distraught. He somehow is allowed to assist with the autopsy, but he like never leaves her head. And like in her casket, he arranges things around her head and her neck. Like he's covering something up. But uh, he has like a an excuse why he's doing it. Oh, this makes her look more comfortable. You know, this makes her look more natural. This was her favorite scarf, so on and so forth. They bury her. They have a funeral and barrier, and a few days later, her mother starts getting these visions of her, telling her, that's not how I died. My husband killed me, in like full description detail of what he did. She said he strangled her and broke her neck. Well, her mother, you know, started telling people, hey, you know, it won't these visions won't stop. Like, she won't stop coming to me. Can we exhume the body? So they exhume her body, do another autopsy, and her neck was broken, and her, her esophagus was pretty much crushed, like somebody strangled her. So they try her husband. He's found guilty, but, like, the official documents isn't that she he's convicted based on ghost testimony it's a series of circumstantial evidence but technically if it wasn't for those visions her mother would have never asked for an exhumation and then nobody would have found out what really happened wow that's is that a true story yep it happened in west virginia and lewis West Virginia in 1897. Dang. It's a good thing they listened to her. I wonder how, if she would have been listened to now. I don't know. <clears throat> if you ran into a prosecuting attorney's office and it was like, I keep having visions of my dead daughter that's telling me she died this way, they're going to check you into a mental facility. Yeah, that's true. They would be like, um... What? <laughs> Are you okay? Uh, she would, I mean, let's yeah, see. I mean, over I, too well. <laughs> I realize the show Medium is loosely based on a real story of a real medium that worked with um, the prosecutor's office, but. That's a damn good show, too. Mm -hmm. I still <laughs> love that show. But, but still, it wasn't, you know. They weren't walking around telling people that she was a psychic and that's what she was doing. They gave her, like, another title to kind of, like, cover it up a little bit. Right. But that's why I was so interested in the exorcism, like, the exorcism stuff. The, um, go listen to that episode if you haven't listened to it. Is I know the church makes you go through like a gauntlet of mental health test and physical test to make sure it's nothing well, not anything physical or like a mental illness or anything like that so but yet our legal system doesn't really they're like nope you're crazy 
no matter what you're crazy. And there's been other cases like the the Conjuring Three is based off of a real case. The devil made me do it. I haven't seen that. That one is about this teen or this like college age kid. His little brother was possessed by like sixty demons. And Ed and Lorraine Warren were assisting with the little boy's exorcism. And the older brother told the demons to take him instead of his little brother. So, in the movie and in, like, every story you read on it, um, that's exactly what happened. He went home, I think it was within a few days, if not the same day, and killed his landlord. And then was put in the hospital. And, um, like, there was... In the movie, there's, like, weird stuff that goes on in the hospital and stuff like that where it's not very realistic, but um, I would assume there's some grain of truth in that. Like, there was people in the hospital that were having experiences around him because, you know, Hollywood is going to blow up and make it look bigger than what it was. But um, that's exactly what his defense was, is he was possessed. And... The Warrens kind of went back and forth on it, but it actually went to court where that was his defense, as the devil made me do it. Wow. So, where would possession fall? Would that be um, not guilty based on mental capacity or defect? Which is the crazy defense, pretty much. Or... Is that movie out now? <clears throat> yeah. I don't think I've seen that one. It's a good movie. I mean, you can kind of... If you're I love like the us, Conjuring movies. I haven't seen that one. Well, if you're like us and have been reading, you know, like... You and I started reading Ed and Lorraine Warren stuff like a long time ago when the internet was like brand new. Um, like their case files and stuff like that. If you're familiar with it, which I know you are... Then you can kind of get a grasp of what the what really happened by the movie. It's not, it's over exaggerated for sure. Right. They over exaggerate everything. <laughs> everything. No. And the Amityville haunting started with the DeFeo murders, and for a long time he maintained that he was possessed when he killed his family. And there's an argument about that. It makes sense if he didn't act alone because that many gunshots going off in a house is bound to wake somebody up. And they were all shot in their bed. Even only one think, of them looked yeah. only one of them was like like they tried to get up. And he maintained that all the way up until like his last pearl hearing and then he switched his story up and said he was lying. I didn't realize that like that was actually brought into court. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's crazy is uh, uh, the thing I've always found to be crazy about that story is the same what DeFeo tells or describes as what he's seen as like the demon or whatever entity was trying to possess him is the same description that the family gives in their book. So maybe... He did, was possessed and killed his family. Oh, I, I don't think that that's, like, far-fetched. Because that's actually what I think might have been involved with the Mark and Debbie Constantino. Oh, what happened there? Paranormal investigators. Mm, but they're probably most known for being on the Ghost Adventures. They were on, like, a couple episodes, I think. And he murdered his estranged... I guess she was estranged wife. They used to be married. Um, and then killed himself. And the reason why I think I possession could be involved is because they... When they're out uh, ghost hunting and stuff, the shit that they caught or that she caught on her... Um, 
What do you, the voice recorder did not sound okay. <laughs> like every time she freaking played, like caught an EVP, it was very, very, very creepy sounding. Like it all just sounded evil to me. And then they, I guess they've had a toxic relationship or whatever. That's what I was trying to look through this article to see. Because I don't want to get any of that information incorrect. It said that they had a history of domestic violence um, between them. But they also have always like been investigating and going to haunted places. Well, you know that <clears throat> that pagan belief that like is going to attract like. So if you're a negative person, you're right. going to attract negative entities. And if you're both negative people... Then you're just opening a big door saying, come get me. Which is kind of basically what the this the couple articles that I've seen about it is saying they kind of both were negative. Like, there was supposedly domestic violence. Like, they both accused each other of it. But it also says that Mark was charged with kidnapping, domestic battery. Okay, this says they were billed as experts in EVPs. I didn't know that. They appeared on several of the episodes uh, from 2008 and 2011. But the things that she always caught, when I seen them though, they were on, they weren't on Ghost Adventures. It was on like a YouTuber's channel. I want to say live, the live sci-fi channel that I seen the most on there. I wonder if I could find a clip that would be usable. Their, her EVPs that they caught well I guess maybe they both caught them I'm not sure but they were they did not sound good and the energy between Mark and Debbie when I watched them looked like it just they, fell off through the screen like, I mean it just fell off I hope they weren't the type that was like bickering while they're on the job especially so did he get possessed or did she I don't know. I always thought him until I seen was seeing more things where they said it was kind of both of them. Because they were saying she was abusive too, so maybe it's one of those situations where they were just both toxic and maybe they were probably... Uh, maybe both of them. And there is that theory that it could just be one entity, but it's manipulating both of them. Yeah, or that. Oh, it was so long ago that I seen that like heard the actual EVP though I wish I could remember what they were actually saying though because it was ugh, fucking creepy usually EVPs don't bother me that much because for one you can't really understand what they're saying or any of that stuff this shit was very creepy I don't know we've caught some ones that were pretty clear just all of a sudden a voice there where there wasn't when it was, weird. It was just me you and Sarah and yeah, like, wait, hello, who are you? <laughs> yes, me, ma'am. And they would, you know, <laughs> answering questions and stuff. <laughs> and I remember we've gotten some pretty clear... I mean, they weren't creepy. They didn't sound like, you know, I'm going to eat your face. But it was very clearly a voice and distinctive what it said. What, uh, the one Mary one that we got that one time we were in the cemetery off Deering Road. Sarah was standing in front of a grave and she's just holding it and she said what's your name and then her and I start talking and when we listen to it back in between us talking it was a very distinct Mary and she took a picture of the grave we were standing in front of and it said Mary and then I don't remember the last name but I remember back at her house when we were reviewing it like that made every hit hair in my arm stand up like mm, no we're not going back there now mary's too talkative well we've caught some pretty crazy evps i wish that everything back then wasn't like on an actual tape or <laughs> like it wasn't like it is today where your cell phone is everything i know it was so like complicated <laughs> just to get any type of and we didn't have like, that's why we never tried we we're like I with it well we never had video because like i said it, your our phone capabilities were barely able to send a text message from the cell phones that we had back then so 
and the cameras were like super shitty. Right. Of course, nowadays though, the shit that they still, I mean, no, it's not from the good phones, but the fucking photos that people release are still that quality. So it's like impossible to see anything. Some of that I understand and some of that I don't. Like, um, there was one I seen, it was very clear and I shared it on the Facebook page. It was very clear if you knew what you were looking at. Like, it took me a few times watching it before I caught it. But it was, it was obviously like a residual energy, but you seen a very human-like dark shadow walk through the, the trees and then bend over. And it was like clear as day. I mean, there wasn't a person there, but there was like a black shadow walking through there. If that was Photoshop, that dude like needs a job doing that shit. It was that clear. I mean, you couldn't see features because of course there was none, but right. it was very clear it was there. And when he bent, it bends over, it just disappears. Like, never was there. <laughs> that would be like... Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, you, you still haven't told us who died, what happened. <laughs> just that you think one of them, uh, they were possessed. Oh, Somebody... sorry. Um, Mark, uh, I don't know if this is alleged or not. I want to say that they know <laughs> because they're both gone. But um, he shot her and murdered her and then he after that. Yeah. Yeah. A standoff, that's the word I'm looking for. With the police and stuff. So he was a death by cop. Uh what do you mean? Death by cop is when they purposely antagonize the police so the police have to shoot them. Oh no, I think he did it himself because they heard uh, it inside before they were able to get in. Yeah, that definitely sounds like... There's not one. like really a whole lot of information though other than they've, you know, have already, they've gone through things. And that Mark was charged with kidnapping and domestic uh, battery. Her oh, her daughter was their or their daughter was also charged with some stuff too. So could have you know been the influence though if they've been always doing this stuff. It could have totally influenced all of their life. Yeah, that's not out of the realm of possibility. You know where it could have included them and then their. Her, well, I don't know if it's their daughter together, but her daughter. Oh, she was missing, and they found her by pinging her cell phone. And they found her in the apart one of the apartments. And when the officers responded, there was someone began shooting at them through the door. And that's when they discovered that she was inside being... Oh, he held her hostage. Okay. He fired the shots. So, he was shooting at the police, too, though. I guess that's a pretty good cautionary tale for paranormal investigators. They keep your shit positive. Right. And it could be a coincidence, but to me, I don't. that was my first, I don't know, my first thought because of their line of work. Because you do have to be careful with that. I wonder how long in between their last paranormal investigation and that happening. Hmm, that's a good question. I know, I don't think it was in one of that. Because they were at the Wa Washu Club. Is that what it's called? That one stands out to me. I just don't remember what fucking thing I watched it on. I watched so much, um, so much stuff like that. It all does seem kind of blended together after a while. But yeah, not a lot yeah. there. But I just thought, you know, I think they could have picked up something for sure. Hearing those EVPs, I for sure think that they could have picked up something. Well, if you're abusive, negative people, and you're going where you know, well, where it's assumed is a paranormal hotspot, it's not. I mean, anybody who's researched anything in paranormal or, you know, has any type of spiritual um, belief in that knows that you don't go into that with a shitty attitude. 
Because that's what you're going to find. Yeah, you really shouldn't. <laughs> because it's, it's all about the energy. So if you come in with the energy. That was something that, um, looking back on when we lived on Washington Street. And I don't know if it was what exactly was going on there. But I don't remember a lot of like explosive fights in that house like most people if they had that type of energy they weren't comfortable in that house those people never hung out long if you go by the like attracts like then maybe it was you know they were feeling it a little bit heavier because when we lived there everything was always pretty much lighthearted and, and always trying to have fun the boys right, were little, even if the negative so. tried to seep in, right. you tried to kick it out the fucking door. Right. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> right. Everything, I mean, not that it was always a party, but everything was pretty lighthearted there. Like, we didn't, there wasn't a lot of fights, and there was always people, always positive energy people around. Maybe that's what kept the boogeyman in the basement. We were just having too good a time upstairs. The, and the only time that there was like a explosive thing that happened, it was done and over with in a matter of like seconds. They, um, that, I don't want to say his name, but the person that when I was growing up that was always a dickhead, um, <laughs> you know who that is, <laughs> came like busting through the front door. And King, my dog, just grabbed him and held him to the floor by his arm. And the cops came in, picked him up, and that was that. And then we just went on with whatever the fuck we were doing. It was... But there wasn't, like, that was, like, the only time in that house that anything like that happened. There wasn't a lot of fighting or arguing or any of that. Yeah, not that I remember. It was uh, mainly, you know, like if raised voices, it was telling the boys to go take a bath or something like that or do their homework or their chores. It wasn't. Yeah, little mouthy teenagers or little yeah. ones was always what was involved with that. Yeah. <clears throat> Not anything like <laughs> at each other's throats or anything like that. Yeah, looking back at that, and I always found that interesting. <laughs> it really wasn't just our energy, it couldn't. It couldn't influence too much, and the one person I think it did influence was, you know, was kind of a negative person at that time. Yeah, definitely the negative, they does feed on negative. That's why they're always trying to get you scared, and so they can I think, feed off of that. I think that was the, uh, maybe another thing is I don't ever remember being scared like I mean I there was a couple times where I did get scared I'm not gonna lie but like as a majority of it like whatever was happening upstairs it it wasn't scary it was kind of like we just looked at each other and was like you seen that yeah all right that's what I thought <laughs> we just go back to whatever we were doing bitch did you hear that <laughs> yeah okay I'm sure I <laughs> Quit pulling the blankets, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would get scared sometimes, but it was just like, mainly just on the stairs. Well, no, that's a lie though, because in your room, I didn't like that hallway. That tiny little, if you could call it a hallway, I didn't like it. Yeah. There was a time I got, um, I went down to do laundry in the basement and this by this time nobody was living down there anymore we were getting ready to move and I went down there to throw in a load of laundry and I heard like it sounded like somebody ran up behind me and like said my name right in my ear so I was like la 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 finish what I had to do and like quickly was trying to get up the stairs and the, the basement door slammed shut now, the weird thing is, is this was 2001, so technology was not where it was at today. Like, there was no such thing as a wireless speaker back then. 
there wasn't even no such thing as like an MP3 player. We were still listening to CDs in 2001. But before I went downstairs to do laundry, we had always had a big stereo in the living room. So I was playing music really loud. The song I was listening to was Coma by Guns N' Roses. That has a very, very dark like bass line that goes through it. Just one part of that song was looping on every electronic device in that house. The alarm clock, the everything. The, the TV was playing it. There's no way pot, there wasn't technology invented at this time that could do that. But what freaked me out the most is the house was so old, the basement door had settled and like shrank to where it never touched the actual strike plate. So the door could never shut. We had an eyelet hook up there to shut the door to keep the dog from going down there. Or, or you know, like people accidentally falling down it. I remember, I was home by myself, so nobody else was there. Oh, when I went down there, obviously I didn't lock the eyelet hook behind me. That would be impossible. But that door didn't shut, and I could not, for the life of me, pull it open. My mom ended up coming in the back door, and like all the music stopped at once, and it took her a couple tries pulling the door for her to actually get it to open. That, yeah, I would have been like, mm, no thanks, bye. <laughs> that's when I got, that was the one time I was truly fucking terrified. Like, when I came out of that basement, I I looked like I seen a ghost. I, I was <laughs> white, shaken, like, could, like, couldn't get control of myself for a minute. That fucked me up because I knew what was going on wasn't possible. But yet it was happening. And it was when we were in the process of leaving the house. Like I was doing up the laundry so, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about it when we were moving things. But you guys will probably hear a lot about that house because I lived there a long time. And a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, happened. and there's many things that happened there. That was the only time I was glad we were leaving the house. It was a sad, we weren't, we didn't want to leave that house. We loved that house. <laughs> like fit our family perfectly <clears throat> but well, we were all kind of sad when we when we had to leave it and but that was the only time i remember being glad that we were leaving that house because something didn't for sure did not like that we were leaving until next <clears throat> time everybody bye bye <laughs>